Well, lots to cover tonight, and the Firefighter Union president is in here to tell us how the deal was made. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Uh, we have had numbers of conversations here with Paul Dowdy, the president of the Providence Firefighter Union, on the dilemma that he has had with City Hall in Providence and Mayor Lorza, who had just dawned on, geez, I think the firefighters really want to work four shifts. Uh, yeah, especially if you got a contract that says they should. Uh, this whole thing has been kind of worked out to its uh, end run, sort of, and I'm not sure yet that the city is going to ignore the financial break that they think uh, they're getting in this whole thing. But we'll talk about the details with Paul Dowdy coming up in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, welcome in. Nice to have you aboard. Let's swing over to the rundown and just see what we've got here. Yeah, it's a one sheet doctor's report. This is the latest way to do business with the American people. Jump on. Dr. Oz's show and show him your doctor's analysis, which is more, you know, which is as political, I would say, as the cholesterol numbers. Here's the latest. Hillary Clinton returns to the campaign trail today with a rally in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's the Democratic nominee's first appearance after a three day rest from pneumonia. I'm really glad that I did finally follow my doctor's orders and take some days to rest. Uh, instead of just trying to keep powering through, which I, I think is a, a common experience for people. The latest CBS News poll shows Clinton with just a two-point lead over Donald Trump in a four-way race with third-party candidates. She still has a big advantage among women, 13 points, and an 83-point advantage among black voters, while Trump leads by 11 points among men and white voters. Trump is talking about his own health today on a syndicated health talk show, and his campaign made public a one-page summary. The paper offers some information about Trump's physical condition, and what appears to be a swipe at Clinton's pneumonia-induced break, the campaign said that the records show Mr. Trump is in excellent health and has the stamina to endure, uninterrupted, the rigors of a punishing and unprecedented presidential campaign. Last night in Ohio, the Republican nominee questioned his rival's stamina. In this beautiful room that's 122 degrees, do you think Hillary would be able to stand up here for an hour and do this? Trump speaks today in New York and New Hampshire. It's just amazing to me that he can't keep it together, but it doesn't seem to be bothering anybody. It seems to me right now that Hillary had such a bad deal with her non-disclosure of her pneumonia and uh, you know her uh, basket of deplorables I told you this would happen by the end of the week, that she would be uh, down uh, in, in some polls and swing states. Quinnipiac has her down five points in Ohio and a few points in Florida, which is not good uh, for Hillary Clinton. It seems to me the American public uh, is just taking it for granted that Donald Trump is just a big, fat jerk. But okay. You know, because only a big, fat jerk would say something like that last night after he tried to look sensible about her health issue only a few days ago. Uh, in the meantime, he's got a little bit of pressure. The New York Attorney General and uh, only a couple of others are actually paying attention to this particular headline here. Uh, you know, what he's done with his, with his foundation money, you know, the, uh, the contribution in Florida, and now some of the uses of his foundation money are coming under scrutiny. But I will tell you this, it's not resonating. You know, everybody is screaming in the media that he ought to release his taxes, and he's not transparent, and he should, and it's not resonating. Until the polls reflect that he has to clean up these problems, he's just not going to. Um, that's just the numbers. Speaking of the numbers, the ProJo headline in Ed Fitzpatrick's column today uh, suggested that the Speaker of the House had a bad day. Eh, yeah, and no. I mean, here's how many were ousted, Democrats, uh, a couple of nights ago in the primary in an all-record low turnout. The guy on the left there, John Simone, has got the, the biggest challenge. Here's some of the, the, uh, the names uh, for the pictures. These folks all lost their races, uh, mostly due to the left-wing progressives that are coming like a freight train inside the Democratic Party right now. Got some national attention. The Huffington Post noted that uh, Ms. Wranglin Vassal, uh, you know, upset uh, John Simone. It is the subject of a recount tomorrow, but most likely she'll hold on. Here's Eyewitness News. 
being for poor. They sat next to each other and debated on newsmakers at the start of September. A political unknown, a school teacher named Marcia Wranglin Vassal, and the second most powerful person in the House, Majority Leader John D. Simone. Because you will not seek out anyone who's poor, disadvantaged. I've been fighting for poor people, people of my district, my entire career. When the dust settled Tuesday night, D. Simone was knocked out of his spot. Uh, like in every primary uh, season, we always have a few upsets, and we had some last night. None bigger than the 16-vote loss by D. Simone. So close, D. Simone's already petitioned to the Board of Elections for a recount to take place Friday. Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming says turnout statewide was less than 10%, so it's tough to read too much into it, but said now there's likely a lot of movement behind the scenes to see who will be Speaker Mattiello's second in command. So I think you're going to see people in the General Assembly right now probably jockeying for position, trying to line support up to get them in a position to be the majority leader. And let me tell you something, the bench is not very deep. It's just not. And uh, am I grinning over D. Simone losing? Yeah, because he's cocky. Am I actually grinning over the uh, the opponent, uh, Ms. Wranglin Vassal, winning? Not if you want to keep your your uh, checkbook in in, in check. Uh, she and some of these folks who are winning these races are going to change the General Assembly in another session or two uh, into a tax and spend runaway freight train. So be careful what you celebrate. In the meantime, I'm not thinking the speakers crying a river over D. Simone. Um, appearances might be that they're together behind the scenes, not so much. Uh, competing plans, real quick. I just wanted to check in with this. Uh, Joe Paolino, the former mayor and downtown developer, now heads up this economic group in Providence, uh, announces his plan to kind of clean up Kennedy Plaza. A uh, couple of headlines here, WPRI.com as well, on, on the panhandling issue. Uh, I mean, does Joe not make some sense here? Listen to part of his presentation. If somebody is, if somebody is sleeping on a sidewalk, I think every American should have the right to sleep in a bed, not a sidewalk. If somebody is trying to find their food out of a trash can, I believe that person should be eating from a kitchen table. If somebody is getting arrested for drug addiction, I don't believe they belong in a prison. I believe, believe they belong in a treatment center. So if somebody is sitting on a sidewalk, is that conducive to what we want? Why do we have public parks? Just very nicely, Ask them to sit on a park bench. Me meanwhile, they're screaming outside about, you know, what kind of a bad guy he is. Uh, listen, he's trying to, you know, obviously he's got his own interests in mind. He's a business guy downtown. But as the city goes, so goes Rhode Island in a lot of ways. This is a very difficult dilemma. He's trying to raise $5 million, has a goal of raising $5 million to aid the support services around the homeless community to see if they can redirect some of the energy and the behavior. Uh, and really, Jorge Alorza this morning, uh, just kind of followed his lead. So this is a best practice that we've uh, that we've borrowed from from another city, from another community. And what we've learned is that when folks give to panhandlers, uh, it's usually it's usually done out of the kindness of their heart. And people do it because they want to help. And what we want to do is enlist enlist the entire public and the entire community that truly wants to help on the best and most effective ways of giving. And so, you know. I think that every advocate will tell you that uh, the most effective way, the most effective approach is to make sure that these folks have the services, the wraparound services that we need. And so we want to redirect as much as possible the resources that people want to contribute out of the goodness of their heart to go to the programs and services that address holistically the challenges that these folks face. Uh, translation, city's broke, can't help, Private industry has got to help. Private uh, social service organizations have got to help. Okay. Uh, what the plan really is, I'm not sure I know. And you know what? Any public official, even the mayor, um, I have empathy for it because this is not an easy solution. We'll uh, work on this more over the next couple of weeks as this becomes more and more high profile. In the meantime, uh, you know, I think he did cry uncle. I think he, uh, <coughs> I think he got choked in this particular situation. The headline from uh, earlier, over the last few working days, tentative accord on fire staffing, and so there you have it. It is one of the core issues that was uh, separating the firefighter union and the mayor of Providence and the president of the firefighter union. Paul Dowdy is here once again. Good to see you. You got Good a tan. To see you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, amidst all this uh, this challenge, you've been getting to the beach a little bit at least. Could be the high blood pressure. <laughs> 
uh, been there, know that. Yes. Uh, you have to wear the red shirt to, to kind of, you know, fake everybody out. Um, you were uh, you were smartly humble when you did not take a congratulatory tone on this. Uh, why? I think once you reach an accord, uh, no matter how bitter it was before that, you change your role from an advocate to a statesman because you've agreed to this agreement and moved it forward so you have ownership of it. Am I happy with all the provisions? No. Am I happy what caused it or how we got here? Absolutely not. But my role now is to bring it out, present it fairly, convince the city council that uh, the numbers are accurate and then same thing with the membership, make sure the membership fully understands all the provisions of it and then hold a vote. Ratification from the union will be when? Um, we're still finalizing some technical language related to it, so I would say within uh, two weeks, three weeks. You have been humble, smart, statesmanlike. I have characterized, however, that the, the mayor uh, got beat badly. Listen, we've been ha having this conversation for, for quite some time. This was going to end up into kind of a mutual Armageddon problem. I am absolutely certain that your point of view would have prevailed on the big issue, which is the four platoon, three platoon thing. And we'll talk more in detail on the next uh, sec segment about the difference between the two. Uh, I am certain the Supreme Court would have gone in your direction, yet it would have put the city in such a financial predicament that everybody loses because you could have flushed it all in a bankruptcy, right? Right. So there are a number of competing considerations that we looked at. Uh, if, if the award damages, the, the amount of damages that will result from the ward were so big we could actually push the city into bankruptcy which hurts us. So that's why some of the concessions uh, are contained in this agreement. Additionally, um, I think this really demonstrates it sometimes the inequity between the employer and the employees. Even when the employees are represented by the union, the employer can still do whatever they want unilaterally. And that's what happened here. There wasn't the process to decide and determine whether it followed the collective bargaining agreement or state law takes so long that if the pain they're inflicting in you uh, is painful enough, it's going to cause you to um, take a different look at what you would consider a reasonable settlement. Yeah, at the same time, uh, I think there's going to be some retroactive cure to your pain, and that's probably not getting a lot of attention, and we're going to talk about that when we come back. Too. Before we continue with the firefighter union president, let me just give you a summary from it. I wouldn't snooze as to how this whole thing came together. A civil environment. By the time retired state Supreme Court Chief Justice Frank Williams got the call to mediate, the bitter dispute between the firefighters and Providence's mayor was 12 months deep. We had to feel our way, all of us, as to how to start because of all the issues that were outstanding. Was there ever a point when you were um, working with this where you thought, boy, I, I just don't think we're going to get there? Yes. All, all mediators, I think, have a, a point or points where you worry about success, and I certainly did. And skins. Monday night, Fire Union President Paul Dowdy and Mayor Jorge Alorza settled. Working forward. The mayor agreed to switch back to four platoons instead of three, and Dowdy agreed to lower the minimum manpower for those shifts from 94 to 88 to save the mayor on overtime. It gives me great pleasure to announce that hell has frozen over. <laughs> you know, no one walks away with everything they wanted, but I think that that's a sign of a good agreement. We did that. Williams said with the amount of name calling and personal attacks, he had both sides focus on one thing at a time. Tone down the rhetoric and at the same time approach the substantive issues like minimum manning, uh, raises. And it all culminated in a handshake. Speaks a thousand words because we, we've kind of gone around the corner and crossed over the river to where we can we can really be a team again. It's not over though. The wage firefighters made while on the three platoon shift the last year still needs to be resolved. And there's still a few more things to figure out now. Yes, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it. I'm hopeful, uh, more hopeful than I was a week ago. I'm not sure uh, the former Supreme Court Justice will have a significant role in that last issue. It's going to go to arbitration, or are you going to try to mediate before arbitration? Well, I think what the, what the city demonstrated with this last uh, agreement is that they do have the ability to reach agreement. So I think I'd probably need to at least explore, probably on a, a parallel path, continue with arbitration so we don't get any further behind or delay that settlement. But no decision is ever guaranteed with an arbitrator. We feel very strongly that we'll have a successful case, but it's not 100%. Uh -huh. So there's an opportunity for him to 
at least test the waters. So let's break it down. For people who didn't follow the, the, the nuances of this, once upon a time, uh, Mayor Lorza, about 14 months ago, decided that he was going to save the city buco bucks by changing the four platoon shift, meaning the four, the four shifts that you guys operated on, which would cause you to work 10 days, 10 hours, 10 hours in the daytime, and 14 hours and 14 hours in the nighttime with a four-day break. Um, he would move that from a 42-hour work week to a 56-hour work week with right. only three shifts, uh, which really meant the same kind of work schedule with only a two-day break. Um, firefighters are peeling off left and right. Uh, the attrition uh, was accelerated. Uh, I don't think they programmed that in. Um, no. State law allows a city management to manage the way they want to, yet state law also requires collectively bargained compensation for such, and right. that was the wicket he never really focused on. He got some really bad advice because he's working off a North Kingstown precedent where everything was different. They had, they had an expired contract, they had a gap between contracts. You were in the middle of a contract, and anybody with a, you know, a half a days of law school could look at this and say, DOA that you guys wouldn't roll over and he had nowhere to go with this, right? Absolutely, and it really came down to a trust issue because we pointed out all these um, failures in his legal strategy, but he bought into the to snake oil that Cavaza and company were selling. The lawyers. That, yeah, the that lawyers for the Kingston. city, the outside lawyers that had been successful in North Kingston, and, and they sent out mailers to all the municipal leaders in the state and tried to get them to buy on. So they were like uh, lawyers that are chasing car accidents saying, hey, we can save you a third of the cost of your firefighters. And I tried to dissuade the mayor from following this advice, pointing out a couple issues. And one is you can change the shifts, but you can't make me work more hours or not pay me. And that was what took 13 months for them to kind of realize, digest, well, was, it, and understand. It was tough for you guys because you really didn't want to go to 56 hours. No. Uh, he was trying to save on overtime. And he's saying that the minimum manning, the, 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 the having to have 94 uh, firefighters on a shift um, create, and not having enough to supply that created an overtime compensation. And the, and the, and the public was saying, eh, maybe the firefighters like it this way because they're getting time and a half. Well, who wouldn't want their time and a half? Truth of the matter is, though, you can't, on a regular schedule, move somebody from 42 to 56 hours and pay him the same amount of money, and which is what he wanted to do. And that was the exact problem. Right. We never argued the shift. We just said, if you're going to make me more hours, work more hours, then you have to pay me for those hours. And that's what got lost in translation. Or the mayor was purposely misled on uh, the legal status and the ability of the cities to do that. Well, let's look at the graphic here on what it is that you got. Let's take a look. Uh, there's some increases here. Uh, okay, you have to have an increased health care co-share, uh, but for the most part, you've got some inter incremental pay increases that you're satisfied with, correct? Yes. And you're back to four shifts, yes. effective November 1st, which is, I think, a quality of life issue and a safety issue for the firefighters. Right. Uh, what do you see in terms of giving up the six, the six positions on a minimum manning, going from 94 to 88 minimum on a shift. Is that problematic? In terms of public safety? Yes. No. Uh, there'll be some repositioning of, of the way we deploy those 88 firefighters, and I think that we can, uh, if not approve, at least maintain the same ability to protect the public. All right. So we're going to talk about that and this unresolved issue, because frankly, the firefighters got a lot of what they wanted here, and I don't think the math still works out for the city. Stay with us. And to the mayor's credit, even before I became the mediator, he was already susceptible to going back to four platoons from three, which increases the quality of life of our firefighters. Yeah, because he was watching Dan York's state of mind for a year saying, are you crazy? That may be an overstatement, but could be true. But no, seriously, was there anybody that looked at this thing from you know a zero-based point of view and try and 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 could honestly give Mayor Alorza the advice that he made the right move going from four platoons to three platoons in the middle of a contract? I mean, it was it was DOA from the start. We talked about that. So you know, Justice Williams, um, you know, has a lot of charisma. He's one kooky guy, man. Uh, he, but uh, he can be effective, in, Very effective. In, in this kind of an environment. He could be a hammer. When he's when he not handling his own stuff, he handles his own stuff like a like a basket case. But he's not. A, he's a pretty doggone good mediator. He's very bright. He's very persuasive, and he's a he helped. Oh, absolutely. So you give him credit. Oh, well, absolutely. give credit where credit is due. Uh, 
the two issues that I think uh, the city is having some financial, semantical, uh, wish listy fun with. First, the minimum manning. Uh, you still don't have enough firefighters to avoid overtime at 88 for four shifts, correct? There's going to be there's still going to be a steady stream of overtime. No, that's true. And and the academy comes in when? Uh, probably seven to ten months from now. And that's going to bring you to what? You know how 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 much closer are we going to get to what is understood to be a full fire department? This school is predicted or budgeted to be 80 firefighters and then they're going to, my understanding is they're going to run another school right after that of another 80 firefighters. So within 18 months we could have 160 new firefighters on board. Objectively, will overtime decrease significantly over the course of those two academies? The, the one piece of information that you need to know is how many total employees do we have. So if they do in fact add 150 employees and retirements go back to their normal 15 a year pace, then yes they will. But they control their own destiny by how many total employees they have to work the four 88-person shifts. There's no mandate as to how many they take out of these academies. No, the union has no say in it. And I was very vocal during these last 13 months saying, you need to hire, you need to hire. Because that's, that, coupled with minimum manning, are the two factors that control how much overtime there is. Sure. And one's in the contract that the parties agreed to. The other is it's up to just then. The union has no say. No matter how many they've got in the academy, Correct. doesn't necessarily mean how many they're going to hire. Uh, generally, our washout rate is only around 10 percent, so okay. or, or less. So all right. Well, you know, let's see if they stick to that, and maybe this thing balances off. But the mayor is talking about three million dollar year increases. I mean, uh, savings for five years. Do you see it? Yeah. If you simply look at the the pay difference between paying 94 firefighters and 88, that part is indisputable. If you're going to reduce it by six, you either would have had to pay them overtime from a different shift to work it or pay them their base salary and benefits. Well, They're about the same. We'll see how that whole thing washes out. I'm not so sure it's as aggressive a savings as the mayor indicates because there might be a big lump sum payment still due here for the retroactive year where you guys had to right. work three shifts versus four, 56 hours versus 42. He gave you 8%. You said you weren't going to take it, but it was in the direct deposit. But we couldn't get it out, couldn't right? Couldn't get it out. Right. But I nope, think and we'll still, I'll say it publicly, we'll, if it, during our arguments to uh, argue about what happened during those 13 months, that will be an offset, no argument on our part. We'll allow this, in other words, if, if they give us 100%, I'll let them take the eight out. It would only be 92% they would owe us. Oh, I Theoretically. understand. But right. the point of the matter is, is that you're going to get a near 25% increase because you work 25% more hours. And we should. Hey, uh, well, hello. And it's going to be a lot of money. A lot more money than I think the city is, is bargaining for right now. Uh, you'll keep mum on that because in the end, you think, even with some concessions, you got things back to zero. Back to sanity, right? I'm a statesman, Dan. Hell, frilled. Hell froze over. Nicely done. Thank you. You got the tan. <laughs> uh, big show tomorrow, I'll tell you about it when we come back to do this. And so almost ends the saga of the firefighter union problem with Providence City Hall. Again, I, uh, I have to say, uh, Mayor Alorza probably, uh, listen, if the city of Providence taxpayers have suffered his biggest mistake, well, you've kind of weathered the storm. Whole lot of money spent, by the way, in legal fees that didn't need to be spent by the taxpayers in trying to get something accomplished, which any Kmart law student could figure out would never have gotten accomplished. Having said that, hopefully this ends up inuring to the benefit of the taxpayer because a win at the Supreme Court and a bankruptcy uh, would have really hurt everybody, uh, including the entire state of Rhode Island. The Colonel of the State Police is retiring, and he is my special guest tomorrow night in an exclusive conversation, meaning that's all we're talking about. And I'll see you then. Bye-bye.